I am pleased today to announce the establishment of an independent debates commission in order to put in motion fair, open and transparent leaders debates during the 2019 federal election campaign. All parties did not have the opportunity to choose the debate commissioner and to be a part of the process, not even a short list. This was meant to be straightforward. I'm confused why the Liberals again chose to unilaterally make decisions over how our democracy functions. It was a Liberal election promise to create an independent debates commission, one the party fulfilled Tuesday. But was former Governor General David Johnston a fair choice for the commissioner? Should the Liberals have consulted their colleagues across the aisle? Is it possible to create a debate process without partisan politics? I'm joined now by our At Issue panel. Chantal joins us from Montreal. Andrew is in Toronto. And the CBC's National Affairs Editor and host of The House, Chris Hall, is here in Ottawa. Good to see everyone. Okay, uh, Andrew, we're going to start with you this week. What, what do you make of the idea itself uh, that, it, you know, that we try to make this a little more neutral, that the parties aren't involved, that we get actual reliable debates, I think is the language the government used? Yeah, I mean, the general idea is absolutely one I support. What we've tended to do is to treat debates every election as if they had just been invented. Uh, they've been running them, we've been running them since the 1960s. Uh, but uh, we, we treat them ad hoc. There's this furious last round of negotiations between the TV networks and the parties, self-interested parties all around, mm -hmm. and more particularly self-interest where you know where you're at in the polls. If you're ahead in the polls, you want to have as few debates as possible. If you're behind, you want to have as many as possible. It was unsatisfactory from all kinds of perspectives, one of which is who the hell is the consortium, quote unquote, to be making such enormous decisions about a, a central feature of, of modern elections. So taking it out of the hands of the consortium, uh, regularizing the rules uh, out, away from an election period so there's, it's not as certain who's going to be where on the thing, all that's to the good. But they've bunged it up, in ter certainly in terms of the way they've executed it, in, in the ways that were just alluded to. Uh, you know, why they had to pick the, the commissioner on his own, why they had to, to set, start setting rules without consulting other parties. Uh, this is the Liberals once again, the mask slipping. Uh, and the consortium, just so people know, it's, it's the broadcasters. Uh, the CBC is part of that consortium, although they're probably, I don't know if there would be one going forward under this, this idea. Chantal, what do you think of, of the idea, the, the principle behind it? I um, I don't find the, that the idea is without merit, although I am uh, probably less uh, disquieted by the process uh, in the past. The, yes, the networks tended to get together and try to get the leaders to agree to come on their podium, but in yeah. Quebec, one network has walked away from that process. And the only outcome from that is that there have been two French debates instead of just one, and I'm hard pressed to find that's a bad outcome. Mm -hmm. But it, in matters like debates, election laws, uh, electoral reform, consultation matters. Uh, and the process that led to this, the hand-picked uh, commissioner by mm -hmm. the government alone, etc., kind of poisons the well to start with. It, it is the, true, and I wrote this in our newsletter today, though, that the past two elections, 2008, 2015, have been dominated by, at least the beginning, by, uh, by about these debate debates. And, and it becomes sort of ridiculous that we're not spending time talking about issues, and rather, who should be on the stage, who's going to broadcast it, what's it, what is it going to be about? I mean, it spins into the ridiculous. There were five debates in the last campaign, two in French and three in English. Uh, two uh, dealt with specific issues, yes. one on uh, bilingual, one on foreign policy. I don't call that uh, an example that uh, shows you that you absolutely need to make, create a government appointed body. Well, it was that less. only the government is appointing to take over the journalism. Okay. Yeah. And then offer the product to the, the so-called broadcasters. Okay, Chris, I want Chris in, and then, and then we'll go yeah. back to you, Andrew. Yeah. That, that, is, that is, to me, the two things they were trying to address with this, Rosie, uh, the first is that they wanted to have a, an independent, less partisan-looking uh, debate structure, which uh, we all remember back to 20, 2015 when uh, the Conservatives said they didn't want to be part of one by the Broadcasting mm -hmm. Consortium, and Tom Mulcair said the NDP wouldn't be at a debate that he wasn't at. So that was the first thing. I think the other aspect to this is that while I wasn't a huge fan of the long campaign in 2015, <laughs> I certainly liked the fact that there were five debates. Yes. The problem was that not enough people apparently saw them because they weren't broadcast nationally by the CBC and others. So this at 
at least as a way to make sure that Canadians who live in r rural and more remote areas have an opportunity to watch the leaders as what Andrew has already indicated is probably the seminal moment in any campaign. Yeah, you, and you look, would hope. Yeah, go ahead. And, and there's an opportunity here in the setting of these rules to make them better. Debates can be terrible. They can be distortionary. They can give false impressions. We, we've seen examples of debates that really didn't work. But at their best, they can really be quite illuminating about the candidates and their platforms and how they perform under pressure, et cetera. And when you consider how awful campaigns are generally, they're just filled with tripe. They're filled with meaningless photo ops and attack ads and push polls and all these things. The best part of them is usually the best debates. Uh, there's an opportunity here, it seems to me, to have more regularized debates once a week organize the campaigns around them, gives us something to talk about in the media that we, rather than the stuff that we usually fill our time with. There's an opportunity here to make not just debates better, but to make campaigns better. And again, I think they've muffed it here because they're only talking about having two and again, one in each language rather than having them bilingual, which we ought to be doing in a bilingual country. Yeah, go ahead, Chantal, I see you want in. So uh, two points, uh, the fact that they're saying we're going to set up two debates, they're not forcing, asking, requiring any broadcaster to broadcast them. Or everyone so, to attend either, you don't have to show up. Yeah. Uh, no, but, no. but the, to the point of those five debates that a lot of people didn't get to see because the CBC didn't carry them, I, I hate to say this, but shouldn't the government maybe and the other parties ask the public broadcaster to do this? Uh, uh, would it be absolutely necessary to create a commission? And then I have to say that one fear, and I think it's a legitimate fear, is that the person who least likes to go on debates usually is the incumbent because yes. uh, he or she is under attack right. and it's rarely a great night. You don't win debates if you're the outgoing prime minister. You survive them. I fear that once you set that up, it will be easier for the incumbent to say, well, you know, I'm doing those two uh, commission-sponsored yes. uh, debates, and the rest of it, uh, I'm campaigning. Yeah. Forget it. And, rem yeah. and remember, the, the, the beauty of those five was that they were held in different parts of the country, out west, Toronto, uh, Quebec, um, and they had live audiences. So there was a real sense that uh, people were engaged uh, as, as they watched. And I, I felt that that was really good for all the candidates, and if it had not been for that, we wouldn't have had the kind of clear definition, particularly of the Monk debates on foreign yeah. policy, yeah. the questions around two-tier citizenship, around what to do with Syrian refugees, all of those things came out. So the format was such that we had a much more detailed, much yes. deeper debate yeah. on issues that really mattered, as opposed to if we go back to the two that generally are held in Ottawa and Montreal, yeah. and as a result, I don't think they get the same kind of debate. It's, and th that's yeah. the other question, if I very quickly, who is going to decide the fullness of these debates? It's clear that the questions and now the, the, the journalistic uh, might behind them will be done by whoever is the, 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 the winning bidder. Uh, but I'm concerned about whether then the commissioner gets to say, well, I, I want more topics in here. Right, it right. seems to me he's open under this mandate letter to, to do just that. Yeah, uh, it's almost like you're lobbying for a long campaign there, Chris. I don't want to frighten <laughs> you, but okay, I want to turn, just change gears and do one go round on the issue of expenses for Canada's governor generals. The prime minister has announced that he is going to review this after it was revealed that the former governor general, Adrian Clarkson, has expensed more than a million dollars over the 13 years since she left the job. Here's the PM. Canadians expect uh, a certain level of, of transparency and accountability, and we're going to make sure that we're moving forward in a thoughtful way. Okay, I, I have to say, I read this National Post story in your paper there, Andrew, and I was pretty astounded. It, I mean, that the rule exists, but also that there's no transparency. No one knows how the money's being spent, and there's no uh, obligation to disclose any of that either. It's it's quite it's quite something. So, should it be allowed? Is the rule the problem, or is it the potential abuse? of the privilege that's the problem. Andrew, you go first. I think much more the latter. Uh, n nobody knows what the money has been spent on, and mo most people didn't know that it was being spent at all. Mm -hmm. um, there's some suggestion that, that ex-governors general have some duties to perform after, the, after they leave office. Maybe that's true, maybe that isn't, I don't know. Uh, that would obviously be fair enough that they should be compensated for that. But yeah, it should be much more transparent than it's been. Uh, and the amounts involved, I know some people will roll their eyes and say, well, the amounts involved are trivial in the grand scheme of things of a government. And that's absolutely true. But the way you get to $300 billion budgets is by a, a vast accumulation of people looking the other way because it's just too, too, too small an amount to worry about. Yeah. So you have to set a culture that says that every dollar is uh, precious. Chantal, what do you think of this? I agree that uh, it goes to culture, but I also think that uh, the governor general is not someone who is performing his or her duty 
for a dollar a year uh, and under which circumstances it would be right to provide all of these services. This is someone who is occupying a position that is well paid and then well rewarded with a pension. I, I don't see how in this day and age you can justify the amounts uh, and the lack of transparency. Chris. He hasn't been the Governor General for 13 years yes. and is still ringing up yes. bills of over $100,000. Just so people understand, this came out in the public accounts uh, documents, and you have to have spent more than $100,000 to be listed here. So she's the only one, Adrian Clarkson, who has consistently spent more than that. None of the others have. So to be fair about this, I'm trying to divide, do Governors General, after they leave, have the right to have some help with the demands, the requests, the appearances that uh, continue to follow them at least for a few years after they leave versus Adrian Clarkson herself, who has been the focus, even when she was Governor General, uh, of being a pretty big spender. And I think that's the big question here. If she is spending it, and it, this money, and it is on dealing with requests that arise from the time that she was Governor General, then fine, let's see it. Then people will know the answer. But how many emails could you possibly be receiving that you need a whole staff to answer them? That's that's the question. I don't know. And I, I should point out that uh, she is out of the country right now, the former governor general. So she hasn't actually answered these questions. But um, hopefully we'll get some soon. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.